How's it going everybody? So in this video I'm going to lay out um, my entire philosophy on nutrition and diet for the purposes of maximum health and well-being. So this is going to be part of a probably like three to five part series on my entire philosophy and approach to optimizing health and well-being. So um, I'm going to have a separate uh, video where that's going to be part of the series where I actually define health because defining health is probably the number one most important thing that we can do um, before we ever even sort of talk about ways of optimizing health because a lot of people they all say they want to be healthy and uh, they do all these health practices but they are like a rat on a spinning wheel getting nowhere because they have no working definition with any real tangible um, application in the real world to operate from. And so if you don't know what the goal is, you don't have the goal clearly defined, how do you expect to ever achieve that goal when you have a very ambiguous and nebulous term like health that you haven't actually like defined specific metrics on, um, there's no way that you can actually optimize diet, nutrition, herbs, supplements, and lifestyle without actually clearly defining that. So I'll do that in a separate video, but we'll put it really short here at the beginning of this nutrition uh, discussion in this video. Essentially, um, the def my definition of health, and I think this is what health should be defined as in general, is um, optimizing all markers of disease. So pretty much if you have an autoimmune illness, uh, you, you know, a marker of health would be rever you know, putting those symptoms into remission, okay? Um, so removing autoimmune illness you might have, like basically having no symptoms of autoimmune illness, uh, you know, minimizing symptoms of cardiovascular disease, of uh, anxiety, um, pretty much any symptom of, of any illness or any condition, you want to minimize or have none. So like perfect health would be living without symptoms of any disease, okay? And so the, the less symptoms that you have of a disease, um, of any disease or any illness, like the less unease that you have, right? Um, the more ease you have and the less unease you have. Physical unease, um, physical symptoms of disease, and the same thing with ment mental symptoms of disease. The, the more you minimize those symptoms, the healthier you technically are. Okay, health is living without disease, without the symptoms of disease. Um, so that's the first working defin the first part to this working definition is living life with, with without symptoms of disease. That is health. Okay. Um, and, and interestingly enough, there's a whole lot of health practices that actually contribute towards disease. Okay. Um, you know, if you have like uh, hypochondria or like anxiety surrounding health. Or, you know, like if you're, especially if you're like extremely, um, like mentally claustrophobic, if that makes sense, and you're like squeezing the life force out of you with all of the strict health practices that, practices that you have, that can actually contribute to disease. It, it can, if it's causing health anxiety, um, if you feel stressed as a result of your health practices, you're actually contributing towards disease. At least in my observation a lot of people they're just you know and that's something i've observed in a lot of the clients i've worked with over the years and myself included so that's something to keep in mind um so another side to this is kind of like the prevention aspect so it's a lot easier for us to optimize um markers of health uh, like symptoms uh, that we might have of a disease, like removing those symptoms, very, very easy to do um, because we have a very clear metric. The metric would just be, well, shit, I used to poop out blood and now I don't poop out blood. So that symptom's gone, therefore I know that I'm 
much healthier than I was when I was pooping out blood because now I'm not, right? So that symptom's gone. Um, though pretty much any kind of like uh, symptom that goes away, like that's a very easy metric of health that we can use to gauge whether our practices, our diet, our nutrition, our herbs are working or not. Um, but then we have the other side, which is prevention, and this is a lot more ambiguous, meaning like we don't actually know how relevant some of these health markers are for prevention. So, you know, things like HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglyceride levels, blood glucose, and even things like uh, vitamin D status and, and whatnot. Uh, we have pretty good evidence for a large chunk of these metrics. I think things like triglycerides, um, blood, glu blood glucose, I think these are pretty, uh, pretty clear on, you know, we want to reduce triglycerides uh, to a certain degree and keep uh, blood sugar within a certain range. Um, but things like HDL and LDL are, you know, heavily debated. There's some people that believe there's no debate involved and LDL is a causal risk factor, causal proxy for heart disease, but I just don't think so. I, I do think HDL has a protective effect within a certain range, something like 50 to maybe 70 nanograms per deciliter, but we don't really know. It seems to be more of a proxy for metabolic health rather than anything else. But um, so these are like markers of uh, disease that we want to keep within a healthy range, right? Uh, and so, you know, for what it's worth, like if we're really trying to be objective about this and not, you know, risk using a proxy, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, LDL cholesterol. Do you really want to minimize your egg yolk consumption? Because it's very high in certain nutritional factors that are arguably harder to get from other sources, depending on your working knowledge on things like vitamin A, retinol versus beta quarantine and vitamin K2. You know, you, it, this could be as complicated as you want it to be. But, um, like, do we really want to minimize our egg yolk consumption? in our meat consumption and stuff just because we are trying to like optimize LDL levels and we don't even know if there's a causal link outside of like one consensus statement um, by like the European Nutrition Coalition or whatever. Like that's like the closest thing we have and that's, we don't really have a lot of causal evidence. So in my opinion, I think we should maximize nutrition within the confines of markers that we actually know play a direct causal role. Um, anyway, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can modify nutrition and still keep whatever markers you want within a certain range. So, and we'll kind of like, I guess, talk about those different things as we continue forward. Um, so yeah, health is, health is removing all symptoms of disease you might have, you know, as realistic as that might be for your own willingness to adhere to a program. And then optimizing your blood levels of certain cholesterol and, and triglycerides, et cetera, et cetera. And then beyond that is just like your well-being, you know, like how content, happy, fulfilled are you, how much stress do you have, um, et cetera. And you know, there's a reason why we're breaking this up into parts is because diet, I believe, is a huge factor, but over the years I've realized it's not as big of a, it's not the entire picture. And it plays a significant role, like significant causal role um, that fortifies all areas of your happiness, well-being, and health. But uh, lifestyle and, and your work environment, your mindset and philosophy on life, like what you choose to focus on, the friends you have or the lack thereof, relationships, your sex life, all of, all of this stuff significantly contributes to health. So we'll talk about my philosophy on these other lifestyle factors, exercise, I'm going to do a, a part on herbalism slash supplementation, um, maybe split it up into two parts, and one on lifestyle, one on uh, relationships, you know, um, and whatnot, and career, and all that other stuff. So this one will be about nutrition. So um, let's see, nutrition. 
So at a baseline, I think that it is pretty clear all individuals should base their diet on protein, okay, as a baseline. And in my opinion, I think animal protein should be the base of the food of the food program. Um, the reason why is because, and we're talking about whole animal proteins. We're not talking about protein supplementation, okay? Um, the reason why I think, and specifically animal meat, okay? The reason why I think that animal meat should be the base of the program, and we're talking um, standardizing portion sizes to the amount of protein that they include, is because number one, at a baseline, uh, so we have the minimum daily requirements for protein intake uh, established by the government. And, you know, this is kind of like almost the RDA, kind of, but it's generally under the RDA. And it's very, very low. And most Americans hardly even reach the minimum recommended daily allotment of protein per day. And I think this is a severe contributor to a lot of metabolic diseases, in particular overconsumption of calories, uh, severe obesity, etc. The main contributor to obesity and metabolic dysfunction that I can see, and we're talking in the general population, we're not talking about people who actually will spend hours a day learning how to optimize their health and listening to something highly technical like this particular discussion that I am engaging in right now. We're talking about people who have no working knowledge in nutrition at all. Like, these people are overconsuming carbohydrates and fat like straight up, period. It's not a matter of carbs are bad or fats are bad. It's a matter of, at a baseline, overconsumption of nutrients like carbs and fat, that's only purpose is extra energy to burn, right? They're just consuming too much carbs and fat and not enough protein either. Um, and protein is unique and we'll get to that here in a bit. So, too much carbs and fat, and not only that, but the types of carbs and fat they're eating are nutrient deprived and the most, the least satiating out of all. So um, we're talking refined vegetable oils, we're talking refined uh, starches like uh, white flour, white, not even white rice, but white flour, you know, white pasta, etc. They're eating pizza, they're eating pasta, they're eating hamburgers with the buns, the fries, and the sodas. We're lots of refined sugar. In fact, recently I saw a survey from 2017, I think it was the USA, USDA um, food consumption data, they showed out of all calories in the American diet in 2017, I think it was like 40% of the calories came, 40% so of the carbohydrate calories in particular came from refined uh, sugar, like meaning sodas, like sugar sweetened beverages. Some like 40, 40, 40%, I think. And the remaining, and then there was a, another 30 came from refined starches. And then the rest was like um, miscellaneous, okay? I think it was more than that, you know? So like, it's like at a baseline, people are drinking mostly sodas and, um, and then maybe cereal like for their starches, which is just ridiculous. So to say that like, oh, carbs are killing people. It's like, you know, maybe, but like within the context of a calorically controlled diet, um, in a whole foods diet in particular, I think if they're eating adequate protein as a baseline, it be, it becomes less important whether eating carbs or fat is your main fuel source, as long as it's whole foods and you're eating enough protein. Um, so, because you cannot have diabetes within a calorically controlled state um, unless you're like, you know, on the verge of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which requires a pretty large consumption of carbs to overfill liver glycogen, etc. So anyway, we gotta, before we establish nutrition guidelines, we gotta understand what's actually killing people. And so in the average population, like literally nothing, that, no optimization matters uh, beyond caloric control for them, okay? And the number one thing that's going to help people to stop eating all these excess calories is number one, 
removing hyperpalatable foods, especially refined foods. And number two, um, eating enough protein. Okay. Uh, you know, so what is adequate protein? I'm talking one gram per pound of lean mass per day is optimal. Okay. But at a, at a minimum for survival, uh, 0.5 grams per kilo of body weight. And you'll see lots of different recommendations, but that's to prevent like protein deprivation symptoms. And you know, raw vegans are notorious for like just melting in their skin. Cooked vegan, especially evidence-based ones, you don't eat junk food, tend to hold on to more lean mass, but they still have other issues down the road. Um, but you know, they're definitely not nearly as unhealthy as raw food vegans. And that's because on a raw food diet, a raw vegan diet, you just can't get enough protein, especially bioavailable protein to sustain uh, lean mass, unless you're like on steroids like John Rose. <laughs> so um, <laughs> anyway, and they have, and even cooked vegans have, are notorious for, it's pretty common for them to have high triglyceride levels just on a case by case basis. And I've seen a lot of their blood work where they have high LDL and high triglycerides, even though they eat a low saturated fat diet, which is just weird. So, um, anyway, eating adequate protein is essential. Um, there is a direct correlation between the amount, the strength, and the amount of lean mass a human holds past the age of 65 and, and their levels of longevity. And also, not only is lean mass and strength, specifically grip strength, um, directly tied to living a longer, disease-free life in older populations, but also uh, one of the leading causes of death in populations past the age of 65 is hip fractures, or actually, sorry, but complications from falls and f falling, falling in general. So there's a huge, huge um, link between strength and uh, muscle, lean mass, lean tissue, and longevity. Okay, and I think that's becoming pretty, pr pretty damn clear, which is why there's such an increase in experts like Barbell Medicine. Um, shout out to Barbell Medicine, uh, Austin Baraki and Jordan Fogger Bummer. <laughs> I can't even talk, pronounce their names. But there's a huge increase now in like evidence-based uh, practitioners who push strength training as a mean and, and high protein intake as a means of increasing longevity. So, but you also have these experts like Walter Longo and and whatnot who and Sanchi and Panda to a lesser degree, who uh, try to emphasize like protein restriction and uh, caloric restriction to preserve lifespan. I don't think that's a good idea. I think if I was going to really put my money on it, I would say, you know, because number one, caloric restriction and protein restriction, first of all, it's very hard to sustain and adhere to, um, but even if you could adhere to it, uh, most studies on actual like human populations, uh, like you know the Okinawans who supposedly were caloric restricted and that's why they had such great longevity, um, they were forced to calorically restrict during that time uh, due to World War II, a food famine, and having their island basically held captive by enemy soldiers. So I just really don't think um, like so. That's the first thing is like you know they're calorically restricted out of force, not out of you know, uh, willing. And then of course we have other blue zones that weren't calorically restricted and they're just eating a whole foods diet where they're generally eating more, uh, animal protein than is commonly reported, you know, visiting them during Lent and under reporting their animal proteins. Like if you, I have the blue zone solution by Dr. Butner and he talks about, you know, they, he mentions that eat certain animal products and stuff, but doesn't go into detail. It seems like he specifically avoids discussing the animal foods of these people um, in order to push his plant-based uh, propaganda, unfortunately. So, um, and there's a really good write-up on that. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna name names, but yeah, let, we could, I think it's safe to assume that number one, in these living populations that live a long time, 
Uh, generally speaking, there's a lot more nuance involved in their protein and caloric restriction consumption. And number two, like uh, in all the studies we have on li long living populations, like you, your, your quality of life goes down with that caloric and protein restriction. And generally we see a rise in cortisol with any kind of decrease in, in protein below like optimal ranges. Um, you really don't want sarcopenia as you get older. So limiting mTOR and all this stuff is great for mental masturbation and some of the mechanistic studies we have. But I do think eating adequate protein over a long lifespan in combination with resistance training is probably one of the best things you can do no matter what else you're doing. So like if you're, if you're, wanna, if you're eating junk food, which I don't recommend at all, um, you know, eating tacos, maybe the odd soda here and there, eating like a balanced lifestyle, which I don't think is beneficial. I don't, I don't, I don't advocate that, but you better, like if you eat adequate protein and you do uh, some progressive overload resistance training, you are going to be way better off than the majority of people and you have a much less risk of premature death like on all on all ends this is very very clear from the evidence we have resistance training and adequate protein one gram per pound of lean mass i would say is a minimum for optimal recommendations but preferably honestly i would say the greater protein you eat the better off you'll be there's really no um, negative risk involved in higher protein intakes that have been shown in the research unless you have kidney issues. If you're on dialysis or something, you know, um, there's really no risk for a, a average pop, you know, healthy population with no kidney issues. So uh, another thing about protein is um, protein has, uh, you know, on average double the caloric burn of other macronutrients. And many of the greatest, uh, most prominent protein researchers of our current time suggest that um, there really seems to be no cutoff point um, at which, like, you know, it seems like the more protein we eat, the more calories we burn, period. And, and that protein doesn't seem to promote fat gain ver uh, practically at all, according to these researchers. That's a pretty big stretch. Um, but most of these, a lot of these researchers suggest that protein should be treated as a separate macronutrient, um, especially when we're talking about calories in versus calories out, which is not, which is, which is valid, but it shouldn't be seen as like an exact thing that we got to obsess about, but more so just in the context of how much calories do I eat on average? And then if you're gaining weight, lower the added calories from carbs and fats to promote fat, fat loss, basically. A protein is not something that we should leverage for fat gain uh, or fat loss. It should be kept high at the high end, no matter like pretty much no matter what. And if you want, if your goal is fat loss, more protein is beneficial. Essentially, you burn more calories of protein, and it helps sustain and build lean mass, which also helps you burn more fat and calories over time. Promotes uh, insulin sensitivity. The more lean mass you hold the more efficiently you can partition carbohydrates, okay? This is something that, especially in the low-carb dogma, people don't really talk a lot, a lot about is that more protein, you, or the more uh, muscle mass you hold, the more glycogen you can hold, and the more sensitive your body is to insulin and carbohydrates in general. So, you know, in ketogenic athletes, for example, it's not uncommon for, you know, um, and especially in research, Stefan Fenny, Jeff Olock, most prominent experts in low carb nutrition on the planet, some of their athletes that they've coached specifically can consume up to like 100 grams of carbohydrates a day and stay in uh, deep in ketosis, even up to 150 grams a day, some of them. This, you know, despite their eating 150 grams, they stay in ketosis. And some of them I've seen type one diabetic um, athletes eating up to 100 grams of carbs a day, staying in ketosis uh, while managing their symptoms at the same time because they hold a lot more lean mass. So what that leads to is more protein, more muscle, uh, more caloric burn through multiple mechanisms and more sensitive to insulin there's just no negative side effects to more protein unless you are a 
you know, caloric restriction, kind of like borderline anorexic zealot or, you know, and this doesn't even have to be a vegan zealot thing because like in vegan land, eating enough protein from vegan sources still provides the same benefits provided you don't have the side effects that I have and a lot of people have from eating like beans, legumes and crap like that, which I don't recommend. So yeah, protein. That should be the base of your diet. That should be the, the number one most important foundational principle no matter what diet you follow, right? Eat adequate protein. Um, the more the merrier. I think 2.5 grams per, per uh, pound of lean mass. Wait, 1.5 grams per pound of lean mass is probably like, like the high end of ideal. But a minimum of one gram per pound of lean mass, okay? But I think 1.5 is probably like the high end of ideal. Um, and so the reason why though I say base your protein or base your diet on animal protein specifically, and we're using this adequate gram to body weight amount is because when you're consuming that much protein from animal sources, uh, you are also getting a full, your full daily intake of, of a large majority of these nutrients, provided different animal source meats have different varieties of these nutrients. Um, if you look at chronometer, you could probably find a type of meat that provides almost every single vitamin and mineral you need in adequate amounts, and you would need very little extra foods to supplement. So. Um, in general, like, you know, for me, I weigh, I have probably about 170 pounds of lean mass, give or take. Um, if I eat 170 grams of protein a day from like red meat, that's about two pounds of red meat a day. Um, I'm getting almost all of my B vitamins, uh, the majority of my, my minerals, especially like potassium and magnesium. There's about 100 to 200 milligrams of magnesium and about 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams of potassium if you eat the juices and two pounds of lean uh, of red meat. Um, people don't know that. <laughs> you know, the only other things I would really need to get would be uh, vitamin B1, um, maybe folate, um, Vitamin C, if you believe that's essential, I think that should be accounted for. Um, vitamin A, vitamin K2 or K, vitamin D, right? And maybe, you know, calcium and a couple of other minerals, right? So, but you're getting the majority of your B vitamins and, you know, there's a reason why you have so, like about hundreds of thousands of these people in these like meat-based carnivore communities who can survive for years on nothing but red meat alone. You know, and who knows what will happen after a couple decades. We do have some decade long people who live in there, lots of case reports and things, but essentially it doesn't seem like you're gonna like die of nutrient deficiencies anytime soon if you just eat the, the whole animal protein and nothing else. Not to say it's optimal, but that shows it's nutritionally adequate to supply a large majority of our nutritional needs. This is exactly the primary reason, on top of everything else I discussed so far, that I recommend basing, you know, basing your diet on animal protein and eating the dose of animal protein equivalent to one gram per pound of lean mass. Because if you get one gram per pound of lean mass from whole animal protein, you're covering I like almost like 75 to 80 percent of your nutritional needs of vitamins and minerals. Okay, that's literally you you you're you have a couple of holes in nutrition after that, but very little. And already there's people who don't develop nutrition deficiencies from this dietary pattern in general. Okay, that is the biggest thing ever. And for me personally, I have tried so many different freaking diets in different ratios of carbs to proteins to fats, different types of proteins and fats. I was vegan for a year, a Mediterranean diet for a year. Um, I did just an evidence-based if it fits your macros approach. I've done 
raw veganism. I did the Michael Greger evidence-based veganism. I did a like animal day based diet that included whole grains and all this other stuff. I've done every freaking thing. And I can tell you the number one most important thing that I found that made a significant impact on my life and what I'm seeing thousands of other people as well is basing your diet on animal pro on whole animal protein, getting adequate protein, especially from these sources and everything else is secondary. That is what I've found. And all the clients I've worked with that have actually followed this advice have had very little problems outside of food intolerances after that. So that's the biggest thing. You don't really need multivitamins and things if you get this part under control. So after that, okay, after you do the animal protein to, you know, grams per lean mass of protein dosing, okay, so again, you know, 170 grams of protein for me, because I have 170 pounds of lean mass, that's about two pounds of red meat. Look on chronometer, you'll see, well shit, that's, I have very little holes in my nutrition now. Um, 130 pound female should get about a pound of, of beef, that's about, you know, 80 grams of protein, she probably has about 80 to 100 pounds of lean mass. But a female will probably do better with 1.5 grams of red meat, especially with the iron content, just to be sure they're getting enough, but at a minimum one pound. And that's gonna provide a large majority of their nutritional needs for their basal metabolic caloric uh, requirements, right? So, you know, nutrient, the amount of nutrients a person needs is gonna be dependent on their body weight and their caloric needs for basal metabolic rate. And, and another thing that we not got to understand is like caloric needs, basic metabolic rate, and the RDA for nutrition is like so ambiguous. We, you shouldn't take it as gospel. Like we don't even know exactly like the type of diet they follow, individual differences and things like how it's going to affect your nutritional needs. Again, we have these carnivore people who seem to do fine without even vitamin C. You know, not to say that that's a good role model to replicate. So the point though is like, do we really even know like what, what essential nutrient is? Most of these nutrient deficiency syndromes that we see, that we've seen in history, only happen when people go from a whole food diet to a refined food diet. Like for example, the Japanese, they stopped eating brown rice and started eating white rice and all of a sudden people get berry berry, you know? And now we supplement the, the rice with the B vitamins and they don't get it anymore. <laughs> but would that have happened if they would have just eaten a diet mostly brown rice? Probably not. So is it the refined foods that cause nutrient defici deficiencies themselves? Or is it the, the, the lack of the nutrients, even if you're eating a whole food diet, right? Someone eating just meat, do they need the B vitamins that the rice provides? You know, or do those B vitamins uh, only matter in the context of a rice eating diet, you know? So this is something a lot of people don't think about. And that would explain why these carnivore people don't get these nutrient deficiencies, even though they don't get these nutrients. Regardless though, we're gonna continue and we're gonna optimize anyway, okay? So after that, you know, if you eat the meat, right? You have, uh, you, you, you're gonna lack full, and you know, within the context of the RDAs and whatnot. You're gonna lack folate, you're gonna lack thiamine, vitamin B1, you're gonna lack vitamin C, um, you're gonna only have like half the magnesium and potassium that you supposedly need. And there might be an, a couple other things. Yeah, vitamin K, vitamin A, etc. So I think after you get that, the meat taken care of, okay, for the vitamin B1, the folate, the vitamin A, um, and the vitamin K, I think getting probably like four ounces of liver a day is probably a good idea because that will take care of the majority of these things. Um, and I also think eating, you know, maybe four to eight eggs or something, right, might be a good idea. Now, you don't have to go exactly with my dose recommendations, but just to get a context of how I view it you know, getting a decent amount of eggs and liver every day in your diet is going to provide the
the vitamin A from retinol, the active form, which is important, not the, the you know, better quarantine. Um, much more reliable source of vitamin A. Also, the active animal form of vitamin K2, um, which can provide some of the benefits of K1, but also other benefits shown in Notre Dame, the Notre Dame trials, where basically um, the more vitamin K2 someone ate, uh, generally they also ate the more saturated fat because it came from mostly cheese, uh, the less heart disease they had. There's a huge correlation between vitamin K2 and heart disease. Um, so I think getting vitamin K2 is important and vitamin K1, you know, seems to be able to convert, but it's like, eh, I don't know. So for that, with that in mind, the best sources of vitamin K2 that I can see is going to be, well, dark meat chicken, actually, believe it or not, but then any kind of animal liver and then also egg yolks, which will also, the liver and egg yolks provide you the retinol, vitamin A, the vitamin K2, and also folate and vitamin B1. So I think eggs and especially liver, very important, very beneficial, gives you, all, fills in the majority of the holes that uh, red meat cannot provide. But I will say there seems to be a lot of people who report having problems if they eat too much organ meat, especially liver, over time. But I've, I've seen it's very rare, and a lot of these people are like Frank Tefano, who seem to have extreme orthorexia and just like a really bad relationship with food and hypochondria and they have health problems they don't know what the hell is causing their health problems so I wouldn't really put a lot of weight in what they're saying generally speaking eating about four ounces of liver a day seems to be relatively healthy or you know at least you won't eat relatively safe um, but that's what I would say I would recommend I think that's a good idea um, I've seen experts like Chris Masterjohn recommend something like one ounce of liver a day. And so that would be an even safer, I guess, lower end. But I generally like to eat four ounces of liver a day and a minimum of about four egg yolks a day. Okay. So, and that'll give you extra protein as well, which is very important. You also get omega-3, DHA, and EPA from both those sources. So, um... That will give you the majority of the nutrients you need. So you got the one gram per pound of lean mass of protein coming from animal meat. You've got about, you know, what, like one to four ounces of liver. Then you also got, you know, maybe four eggs or more. That'll provide you with the majority of your vitamin A, even vitamin D, lots of vitamin D in liver and, and egg yolks. It'll provide you with, let's say the retinol, the vitamin K2, um, you know, even other things like molybdenum and manganese will come from these things. Uh, copper, uh, what else? Um, folate and thiamine. So that covers a lot of what red meat cannot give you or just meat in general. And also I, I got to kind of throw out there, if you diversify your, your muscle meat sources, so generally speaking, like uh, fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, herring, like fish is going to provide you with a lot of uh, nutrients that land animals like red meat can't provide, especially things like uh, thiamine and, you know, vitamin B1. So diversifying your meat sources. So, you know, if you kind of look at chronometer with different meat sources, you'll find, you know, like pork, for example, can provide you with your entire daily dose of B1 and liver with your folate. So different animal sources will give you different uh, ratios of vitamins and minerals. So it might be good to kind of look into that, you know, and experiment with different combinations if you really are, are obsessed with getting your daily nutrient needs. Another thing on, on this is that Animal meat uh, seems to be one of the very few foods that like almost all humans can consume without uh, food intolerance issues that you get from plant foods. So it's a good baseline for most people. That's why the carnivore diet people use is like an ultimate elimination diet. Um, and if you can't tolerate certain meats, it might be a stomach acid issue, which I have videos on how to deal with. 
and obviously I'm not a carnivore zealot um, and I recognize there's value in plant foods so after you get these things there's a couple of other holes that you can fill in your diet so I think vitamin C should be something that we should probably just you know you don't have to obsess about but just get anyway it's a very easy kind of hole to fill back in the day I used to be obsessed with vitamin C and I'd be like oh, I gotta eat all these bell peppers and I didn't I could poop them out I had really bad problems with like bell peppers and certain plant foods so um, I think oranges and certain fruits are a great source you could take a ascorbic acid supplement literally zero reason to get any like specialized form of vitamin C you don't need any specialized form ascorbic acid works just fine in the case of scurvy and any other benefit or whatever of deficiency symptoms of vitamin C Okay, clinically speaking, unless you really want to just be weird and appeal to nature and whatever. <laughs> um, so getting vitamin C is important. You can get it through fruits uh, and you can get it through vegetables if you can tolerate vegetables. Generally, most people should be able to tolerate fruits and meat just fine. Uh, if you're on a ketogenic diet, and that's another thing that we'll have to discuss here in a bit, is that there's going to be a lot of people who actually will thrive on ketogenesis. I myself do amazing on a ketogenic diet as long as I get enough protein. Um, and I think everybody should do at least a four week experiment where they do a ketogenic diet, but you got to do it right. A lot of people don't do it right. They don't eat enough salt. They don't uh, eat enough fat and they don't eat enough protein. Okay. And they wonder why they feel like crap. <laughs> but you know, and also they're like, oh, it's been one week and I feel like garbage, cortisol spike, whatever, can't sleep. Um, my exercise performance went down. Ketogenic sucks. Keto, ketosis isn't good. We need carbs to survive, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you need to go about four weeks before you start feeling like a superhuman god. You know, you quit too soon and you need enough fat. So your body's suffering not because of ketosis, but it's lacking overall calories. Uh, especially if you're already lean, you're not eating enough protein, so of course you're gonna feel like shit, especially in a calorically deprived state, protein becomes more important. You know, and if you're not supplementing, supplementing salt, you'll feel like shit no matter what diet you're following, especially in ketosis, because you start to excrete more sodium. So yeah, everyone I think should do a four week trial of following Stephen Finney and Jeff Fullock's properly formulated ketogenic guidelines where they eat a ketogenic diet for four weeks and they see how they feel. A lot of people will be surprised who thought they needed carbs before. They'll be like, damn, I actually feel like a million bucks, you know? Solved my lifetime insomnia, anxiety issues went away, depression, just crazy. And you recover better from exercise, I find. So anyway, not, not relying on carbs is like pretty awesome. I train like three times pretty intensively in a 20, 21 hour fasted period and feel like a damn god. So, anyway, um, that's an important factor, right? Uh, but for those of you who aren't on a ketogenic diet, getting your vitamin C, potassium, and magnesium from fruit, that's like the golden thing. Um, you know, like bananas, very high glycemic load, but if you do eat, if you do want a food that can that contains vitamin C, magnesium, and potassium, and also beat vitamin B1 and folate, fills in all these other gaps that meat can't provide. Bananas are great. Um, very high in carbs and, and whatnot, but it gets a, the job done for nutrient needs. And for an athlete who needs a lot of calories and carbs, if they think they need carbs. Bananas are amazing because one medium banana contains like 30 grams of carbs. That's what, 30 times four, 120 calories per medium banana. And um, quite a substantial amount of potassium, magnesium, and vitamin C. Especially magnesium and, and, and potassium. And vitamin B1. So, you know, and oranges, has, or orange, however you wanna say it, oranges are great. They provide a large amount of vitamin C Decent amount of magnesium, calcium, uh, and potassium. You know, you have things like pineapple, blueberries, etc. So, those are good sources of the rest of the nutrients that you might think you need based on the RDA. Um, another thing, especially for those folks who are on ketosis, 
I find uh, cooked cruciferous and vegetables and carrots um, provide a large amount of trace, you know, like vitamin C, magnesium, and potassium, as well as calcium. Not in large quantities. I think meat actually provides way more and an easier to digest form. But um, if you need another source, and also like folate and B1, if you really want to like kind of dial in those other nutrients, you can be consuming the, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the carrots. I just buy like the frozen mix and uh, boil it down. And remember, I generally follow a mostly meat diet most of the time, generally supplemented with fruits if I'm eating carbs. But um, lately, I've been kind of cycling in some of these vegetables and experimenting with them. And I actually find zero digestive problems after the first couple days. My my gut has to get used to them. Um, I actually feel a lot more grounded. I feel a lot of the benefits associated with um, like magnesium supplementation. I actually do feel kind of these benefits of relax, more relaxation and, and whatnot when I consume high magnesium uh, veg vegetables. So. Uh, I do think there might be some benefit for some people as long as you can digest them. So for the minerals they can they contain certain fruits and vegetables are a good a good idea. These also provide vitamin C and then some of these other potentially beneficial compounds that haven't been proven by science, okay, but they've been correlated. So you know, for those of you who are not deep in like carnivore zealotry, and who don't have autoimmune illnesses that can be triggered by plant foods and plant compounds. Um, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, you know, and if you're not in ketosis, something like sweet potatoes is something you can experiment with. And keep in mind, chronic pain disorders and arthritis can be caused by, um, what it, what is it called? Uh, like nightshade vegetables. So sweet potatoes are not nightshades, but regular potatoes are. Um, and what else are part of nightshade? Peppers, goji berries, ashwagandha are nightshades. So if you have like weird aches and pains, they can be caused by some of the alkaloids that are found in nightshade vegetables. But if you don't have like these uh, commonly reported symptoms of nightshade intolerance, like arthritis, and also there's some people, some experts believe um, destruction, like uh, what is it, breaking down of like the the intestinal lining, they believe can be caused by some of the saponins and potatoes and uh, side effects of nightshades. They believe the capsicum and, and peppers. But you know, I don't really know how true that might be. We don't see that in cohort studies and population studies. But if you do have like some of these issues, you can experiment or removing uh, some of these nightshade vegetables. I will say there's a lot of people that cure their ulcers with, or treat their ulcers with um, cayenne pepper, um, probably due to its effects on balancing out stomach acid, which can uh, help to treat uh, H. pylori and things like that. So, you know, it doesn't really seem like there's a huge causal link between destruction of the gut lining and capsicum and whatnot, but just something to kind of like pay attention to, okay? Um, but otherwise, yeah, lots of magnesium, potassium, and vitamin C come from tubers, you know, like even white potatoes. People, people lump white potatoes in with like a refined grain. It, it's not a white carbohydrate in the same sense. It's very high in magnesium, potassium, and vitamin C, and these, and folate, I believe, as well. I might be wrong, though. So, maybe if you can tolerate um, potatoes and sweet potatoes, consume them as a great part of a nutritionally adequate diet. But if you have intolerances, like I notice, especially like the peels of potatoes, trigger my IBS symptoms, uh, which, you know, only happen if I eat certain plant foods, like, and I eat a lot of, like, plant skins and things, then, you know, um, yeah, be aware that that might happen, but otherwise, 
don't be afraid of eating these foods. These could per contribute to um, a large portion of your, of your nutritional needs. And if you're a athlete wanting a good low glycemic load carbohydrate source, potatoes, sweet potatoes, bananas, um, or, you know, those are high in glycemic load, but you get my pick, my picture, high in magnesium, minerals that you lose your sweat, very, very good options. So, yeah, I mean, low, uh, non-starchy fruits, uh, non-starchy vegetables as well as fruits and tubers, I think are my big picks on plant foods. I think they're great. Um, you know, as like a foundation of health. Now, uh, in my later video where I talk about herbs, okay, um, I'm going to be talking more about medicinal compounds and plants. So like, for example, spices, right? We have rosemary, um, which has like certain compounds that can improve cognition. We have um, cayenne pepper, which has capsicum and whatnot, which can be great for improving circulation, for uh, helping to heal from, from viral infections, bacterial infections. It can help clear your sinuses. I'll be talking a lot more about medicinal compounds in plants, and also some of these polyphenols and tonic compounds found in plants like ginseng and whatnot. And also things like ginger have actually tonic type properties similar to ginseng. That a lot of people don't know about. So I'll be discussing that more in depth in my future videos on herbs and things. Uh, but right now, I'm gonna say, look, food intolerances are huge, okay? This is the next kind of level to this, okay? So if you can eat beans, you know, I believe there's not a lot of harm in eating like deeply cooked beans and, and whatnot. And even things like black rice, purple rice, and red rice. I'm not a fan of brown rice. I think it's very generic in its nutritional properties. But I think there are some merit to these deeper pigmented rices and, and whatnot. Even things like, um, you know, I don't want to go too far off the deep end. But the main problem with things like lentils, beans, and whatnot, look, it's not the lectin content, the saponins and stuff, okay? When we're looking at living populations of people, the ones who eat the, like a larger amount of some of these whole grain foods do have better health outcomes. So I really don't think it's it's rational to say like, oh, like freaking whole grains will kill you, blah, blah, blah. That's not freaking supported by evidence. It's just not. But it's very important to understand that there's a lot of people, myself included, who will, who will feel like they're dying if they eat these foods. I'll have stomach cramps, aerial valve syndrome, and psoriasis the more I eat these foods, okay? I'm fine if I eat them in smaller quantities. If I go to a Middle Eastern restaurant and eat some hummus and stuff, I don't have any problems. But if I eat beans as a normal part of my diet, Especially if you don't cook them enough, man, I just, I die on the toilet. I, I will die. Okay, so, um, generally healthy foods, but it's based on individual differences. So, I do have a blog post about it. It's called The, the Hierarchy of Carbohydrates. I might go and look for it and link it in the description. If you want to see it, go ahead and ask me about it in the comments. Um, but generally, after you get, you know, the non-starchy vegetables, the fruit intake, and the, the meat recommendations, you can add the freaking whole grains, the beans, the nuts and seeds, but just keep in mind some of the negative side effects that they can have. Um, so, you know, and that's based on if you have digestive problems, if you have autoimmune illness, you know, aerial bowel syndrome, colitis, Crohn's disease, like you would be better off just eating the meat and fruit diet because that will heal most of your issues. Um, Non-starchy vegetables are kind of like, some people have problems with them, a lot of them don't. That's why like the, the autoimmune paleo and the paleo diet are so widespread great for like treating some of these autoimmune conditions because they're less, that they people have less intolerances to them. Most people are gonna find that they can include a lot of these plant foods without needing like to just eat a carnivore diet. I don't think people should restrict them to just meat unless they have a real good reason to. Um, I think calcium is important. So I like a bone meal supplement, but I don't think you need a lot of calcium, especially if it's coming from something like bones where, you know, cause I find I get a bit dehydrated if I start to consume too much calcium, especially too much bone meal. So probably like maybe an eighth of a teaspoon of bone meal, like twice a day is probably adequate especially if you get enough vitamin D. 
I think supplementing vitamin D is a beneficial thing if your levels are low. And I've looked into the research and been back and forth with vitamin D. I'll make a separate video on this, but I think, uh, I think it's what, H25 hydroxy, I'm probably butchering the molecular name, but the supposed inactive metabolite of vitamin D is a, is a reliable test to get for vitamin D. So I don't think you need a special, like, I don't think you need to be um, worried about the active form of vitamin D. Um, and a low dose vitamin D supplement just to get your levels up to like maybe 40 nanograms per deciliter or whatever, probably a good idea. So if your vitamin D is in the right status, then your calcium needs are not as high. I don't think you need like the 1000 milligrams of calcium per day that they recommend, government generally recommends. I think 200 to, I think probably about 500 milligrams is probably a good range spread out throughout the day especially from bones because you're absorbing the majority of that um, if you can tolerate dairy dairy is an amazing source of calcium of vitamin k2 of um, what else and especially whole fat dairy um, vitamin d you know you're getting a lot of nutrients from from milk so but uh, this goes back to individual differences and in tolerances i get uh, my sinuses, they get restricted. I get sinitis. I get uh, rhinitis and allergy symptoms if I drink dairy or even eat dairy. Uh, seems to be coming from the casein protein in dairy. Whey protein, even whey isolate for some reason does it to me. So just like the proteins in general of dairy. Um, cheese does it to me, but uh, butter does not. So I find a lot of people, they have allergies to milk proteins. And they don't even know it. So if you have allergy symptoms, might be a good idea to experiment with a dairy-free diet for a while. See if they go away after about three weeks. Um, otherwise, it's a good source of nutrients. So I think I covered the majority here. Um, as long as you get the protein intake down from whole animal sources, and then you fill in the gaps with fruits and, veg and non-starchy vegetables, uh, you'll have all areas of your diet complete just with the animal protein and then like the fruit or vegetables as a supplement. Um, if you want to eat whole grains and stuff, you got to base it on food intolerances. You know, the main thing as far as like a lot of illness is concerned is removing toxic garbage like refined carbs, refined fats, eating the right fats, you know, saturated, monounsaturated in my opinion. And then if you have fat loss goals, removing the added fats and carbs. If you want to lose weight, stick to the non-starchy vegetables, the low glycemic load fruits and the animal proteins and eat leaner animal leaner cuts of animal proteins to to lose weight do not listen to these people who say you can eat unlimited amounts of saturated fat i have personally found that i the more butter i ate on a ketogenic diet it seemed like the leaner i got but that doesn't that doesn't kind of equate to the average population uh when you look at people who are following carnivore diets for example to 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 lose weight there's a lot of people who are like, oh, how do I lose weight? I've been doing carnivore right and I'm still like fat. You know, and people are like, oh, you need less protein, more fat, which is a horrible advice. You need more protein and less fat, which you really need. Um, you know, and then people are like, I'm intermittent fasting and they'll recommend to do one meal a day. Look, the only reason why one meal a day is a logical progression for these people and, and solves their weight loss plateaus is because you eat less calories in that window. So, um, I'm sorry, but eating more protein will burn more calories and provide more nutrients. Okay. You get more nutrients from the protein than you do from the freaking fat content. Um, and you're eating less calories from the added fat. You're going to lose a lot of body fat that way. If you just eat a lot of freaking lean animal protein, that's like the best way to freaking lose body fat. Um, and then you... And then, um, and then, you know, reduce the amount of extra calories from carbohydrates. That's how you lose body fat. But if you don't have body fat to lose, you know, eating more fat is probably beneficial, especially for your hormones. Um, you know, and then like in the non-starchy fruits and uh, non-starchy vegetables and fruits, and you know, the rest of your diet is highly individualized. So. 
if you have the autoimmune illness or whatever, you have digestive problems, whatever, you have neurological disease, you're going to need to specialize your diet for that. But this is like the basic outline, um, you know, so what are some of the blood markers that uh, we're looking to regulate with this, this way of eating? Keep the blood, the, your glycemic control under, under control. Keeping the glycemic load under control, um, which will help to keep your blood glucose down, help keep your hemoglobin A1C down, your fasting insulin, insulin down. Unless you're eating a lot of bananas and just a ton of white potatoes, you're probably not going to suffer from diabetes eating this diet. It's very easy to, you know, um, treat diabetes, type 2 diabetes, by eating low glycemic load fruits. Um, non-starchy vegetables and basing your diet on animal protein, especially if you exercise and you do the resistance training and exercise recommendations I'll be making in later uh, parts of this series, it's virtually impossible for you to develop diabetes this, uh, eating this way, like seriously. Um, you're going to lose weight, your, um, your, your weight circumference is going to go down, um, and we don't really worry about BMI. Okay, it's uh, body fat percentage and waist circumference that matters the most. So your body fat percentage is going to go down, waist circumference is going to go down, lean mass is going to go up. You might gain a couple pounds of muscle. Um, just eating adequate protein studies actually show without resistance training increases your lean mass. Um, you're going to feel better, especially if you're eating the balanced approach I'm talking about and not unnecessarily restricting food groups. Um, you're going to find that, no, you know, you're going to be able to eat unlimited amounts of food as long as you don't eat extra butter and oil and stuff like that. Just by following this pattern, you don't have to track, okay? Because you're eating more animal protein is always good, and then you're not, like, just going to, like, binge on butter or something. Like, you're, you're destined to lose body fat this way. And with that, metabolic parameters are going to come into place, you know, HDL will go up in accordance to your um, fat intake and your glycemic control. Um, LDL might go up depending on your saturated fat intake. Um, if you want to optimize LDL, you're going to want to eat only lean sources of protein. You're gonna to wanna to cut your animal fats um, and you're going to want to stick to more like fish, lean pork, and lean chicken. Uh, that's what you do to get your LDL down. Okay, you can get your LDL down to like vegan approved levels, like uh, 70 nanograms per deciliter, by just removing the saturated fat from your diet. I don't think that's necessary. I don't recommend that. But if you really wanted to, you could do that. Um, you don't need to remove animal foods in order to do that. So again, if you really wanted to get your LDL down the down into the the vegan approved statin drug ranges to impress your doctor. You can get your LDL down to 70 nanograms per deciliter by sticking to the leanest animal proteins, avoiding saturated fat, avoiding red meat, um, especially if you see lean chicken and fish, like there's no way you're gonna have a high LDL unless you're eating butter and shit too. Um, I don't think that's necessary though. So what's another thing? Uh, fish oil I think is important. I think we should be striving to get uh, about two grams of EPA per day, and then however much DHA comes with that. So supplementing with a higher EPA ratio uh, to DHA fish oil is important for brain health, for uh, lowering triglycerides, and for improving HDL. You'll experience a significant benefit to your health, your well-being, your cognition, everything if you do that. So I think fish oil is important. Uh, two grams of EPA per day, and then however much DHA comes with that. I don't think it's a good idea to remove DHA. Don't take these isolated EPA supplements. DHA is important too, but just gauge your dose based on how much EPA you're getting. Um, so that's probably about a, tea, a tablespoon of, of fish oil a day. I think that's great. I think that's amazing. I think that the literature suggests no matter what these other people say, like Ray Pete, that um, I think you're going to experience nothing but benefits especially if you get a high quality brand. Um, and then maybe supplement with magnesium. Uh, I think magnesium citrate's good. Uh, maybe take a trace mineral supplement that contains uh, lithium, boron, and magnesium. That's what I do. 
um, and vitamin D supplement. And if your levels are, are low, um, I think it's important to get a vitamin D test if you're going to do that. So yeah, we'll discuss uh, some of these other things in future videos. Um, just want to get a baseline out there. There might be some things I'm missing here, but I think I covered everything. Calcium, you know, magnesium, uh, getting all your nutrients. So we'll discuss more like uh, of these like polyphenols and things in the next video. Um, we'll discuss like, you know, the research surrounding fruit and vegetable intake in a separate video. Um, I don't think there's causal evidence, but the re most of the research suge suggests um, about, I would say, four to eight cups of fruits and vegetables a day provides a large amount of risk reduction, relative risk at least, which doesn't seem to be clinically significant um, for many diseases, but if there's any effects of fruit and vegetable intake at all, it seems like the more that you include in your diet, the healthier you become. So it doesn't mean that you need to eat fruits and vegetables. It just means like if you do, you're probably probably only going to get benefits as long as you can tolerate them. So I think that's very important to understand what that means. Correlation doesn't equal causation, but correlation is still, you know, beneficial to consider. So keep that in mind. Uh, and I'm going to leave you all at that. So anything that I didn't address down in the comments, go ahead and ask me about it and I'll address, uh, I'll reply to y'all and I might make an, a, another follow-up video. Uh, stay tuned for the next parts in the series. We're going to be discussing lifestyle factors um, like relationships, sleep. We're going to be discussing uh, exercise, how to exercise for health, why you should exercise, how much you need. Um, we're going to talk about positive mindset and how to, how to optimize your mindset for health. We'll talk about things like music maybe. We'll talk about, uh, we're going to talk about herbs like tonic herbs, reishi mushroom, cordyceps. Uh, we'll talk about specific supplements, magnesium, polyphenol supplements, intermittent fasting. We'll talk about all that in the future. So this is just part one. Let me know if you enjoyed this. Let me know if you watch the whole thing down below. I'll talk to you all next time.